uh, someone I consider to be a friend. And you are all here by invitation. And you're here by invitation because you've been recognized as a thought leader in your area of stewardship and professional responsibility. And the purpose of coming together as this eclectic crowd in both academics and privates and municipalities is to find ways to collaborate uh, and to find disparate views on complicated uh, you know, issues and to, with the, that disparate view, come to a kind of a binocular depth vision of, of, of the problem and the solution. Um, Matthew Holland is one of those thought leaders in the area of education. Uh, for those that have been in the Valley uh, their whole life, you've seen the evolution of UVU from uh, a technical institute to a state college to, you know, what it is today. Uh, as a, as a, <coughs> episodically getting education and leading, I, I, I would come and it would be something else, and then I'd come again and be, you did what to it? And then I'd come again, and here it is a university. Uh, it was made a university in 2008 and became a university in 2009 when it received the leadership necessary to really evolve it into the institution that's become. Prior to that, I think as an institution, we suffered from a perpetual sense of, um, of inferiority. We were the second choice of people that couldn't get into BYU. And, uh, and what, again, and, you know, just say the thought bubbles that are above all your heads. Um, but what, is, what has occurred, the transformation that's occurred in the, in, in this, in the solidity of education and the quality of education, it really revolves around the mission and purpose that, that President Holland has given the institution, his leadership. Uh, there are three core themes that have been really driving all of the decisions. Uh, engaged, um, we have engaged, serious, and inclusive. Uh, make sure that the education is something that, that, that you walk away being able to do the thing that you profess to learn. Uh, and that's a, that's a unique thought process in higher education. Uh, by way of qualification, uh, he has his, uh, he has his, his graduation, he graduated from Brigham Young University uh, and has his master's and his PhD from Duke. He also is a visiting lecturer at uh, some fairly uh, significant institutions, Stanford, Harvard, Notre Dame, Oxford, uh, and is a visiting uh, fellow at the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at the Princeton University. Um, he writes routinely on, on government and ethical government. Uh, hopefully um, all of the governments around the world, including ours, will benefit from uh, the thought processes that, that he engages in to find ways uh, for healthy governance. Uh, but with that combination of a, a, a focus on politics and now a focus on education and the marriage, of uh, really how educational institutions serve societies by creating good citizens and also uh, productive workers. Uh, we're thrilled to and, and honored to call Matthew Holland our president. Uh, more importantly, the last thing he does is I don't know where you get in the important stuff, which is to be married to Paige and to be fathering your four children. But with that introduction, uh, we welcome Matthew. Thank you, Wynn. It's, uh, this is very gratifying to see this room uh, so filled with uh, a lot of people I know and love and admire and other people I'd like to get to know better, but uh, all committed to the great cause of uh, this valley and uh, becoming the best valley we can be and sustaining a great, a great economy so that uh, our children and grandchildren can have jobs and opportunities and we can support education and all the great things that we need to do in this valley. So uh, thank you. Uh, and I'll say more about when and his leadership in just a minute. But uh, I'm really here to just talk about the key to economic development moving forward. That's UVU basketball. I'm not proud or anything of a few games that we've had here recently. Uh, uh, but uh, on a little more serious note, let's start with where we are. Uh, and, uh, and, and thanks to Wynn and his, uh, his great leadership of this Business Resource Center. Uh, a, a lot of you are obviously uh, very familiar with what we're doing, but maybe not all of you, so I think it's worth uh, you know, sharing for just a second that all the different agencies. This was designed, uh, our vision early on, uh, I took very seriously when I got the charge from the region that one of my jobs was in addition to building out a great university was to take some responsibility for economic development uh, in this region and, and we thought one of the most ways, the best ways we could do that is to be uh, a convening power and bring together these different entities, the Small Business Development Center, the, uh, the Valley's uh, 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 Connection for U-Star, our Smart Lab that's tied to our, our sales program, 
uh, EDC, Utah, the Procurement uh, Technical Center, Senior Corps of Retired Executives, and the Manufacturing Enterprise Partners. Uh, these are some of the incubator companies. Uh, Wynn's leadership's been fantastic, especially since the frontal lobotomy. He's been much more effective. <laughs> <laughs> We're grateful for the progress uh, he's, uh, he's made here. Uh, just to, to put this in some uh, uh, quantitative context, uh, look what's happened as a result of, uh, obviously not, uh, not just the BRC, but importantly the, the things that happen within it and the different entities collectively, the agencies over the last three years are responsible for revenue growth. Uh, uh, to the tune of uh, over $700 million. You look what happened has happened in equity investments, grants, loans, contracts, uh, nearly a billion dollars there, uh, efficiency savings, uh, $50 million. So uh, we, we look at that as a, a sort of a $1.8 billion uh, uh, immediate impact. And then uh, when you think about the multiplier that comes from those kinds of things, and typically you'd use a higher multiplier, we're trying to be conservative about this, but this is a, there's a remarkable set of things going on in this building, and a lot of it reflects what you're doing and your support, so we want to thank you and commend uh, Wynn and, and the BRC and everyone who participates in this moving forward. So with that, I would like to step back now and talk about the university. Uh, again, echoing some of the things that Wynn's already introduced, we talk relentlessly about our core themes. It's who we are, it drives what we do, and I think it has implications for the things that you folks are interested in with respect to economic development. Um, at the core of our core, we talk about student success. There are a lot of things that institutions can become famous for. Uh, economic development is one of them, and peer review research is another one, and you could look, list a number of things that universities strive for. We're doing those things too, that's why I'm here. Uh, we've already talked about our commitment to economic development, but really, that's what, what drives us at Utah Valley University, is helping students prepare for lives of success in business, in their personal life, in their family lives. That's what we're about, and, and what drives that is this three-legged stool of building an education that's serious, it's committed to rigor and excellence, it's inclusive, it outreaches to everybody, wherever they are, intellectually, culturally, racially, uh, and it's engaged, it's practical, it's connected to the community and what uh, students need to, to uh, survive and succeed in a very practical way. And we do all that by remaining uh, focused as this teaching institution. So just a word about each of those core themes. On the inclusive uh, front, we have stayed open admissions. I know that's a big question in this valley from time to time. We think it's an important part of what we do. Not every institution can be highly selective and discriminatory in that way. We need every region and, and area needs uh, an open admissions place for the students who develop later in life, who have, need a second chance. Uh, uh, who kind of figure out after you know high school that they need to get a little more serious. Uh, we, we need a place for those. We keep tuition and fees low. We're one of the lowest in the nation for a regional teaching university. And we have an active outreach to underserved populations, <coughs> folks who historically have not come to college or who otherwise might be cut off. And you can see the impact of the collective effort here. So since I started in 2009, we've had a 108% increase and students of color at Utah Valley University. We have students now from all 50 states and 66 different countries. Uh, and, and then look at the profile of our student, how many non-traditional <coughs> students, a lot of them working almost full-time, uh, many of them ha a part-time. Uh, as a result, uh, they, they don't always, they're not able to take uh, a full load, and so they stretch this out over time, so some of our students are a little older, uh, and marry, and, and have a child. And then maybe most, uh, for me, kind of searing of all is that last statistic. Over a third of our students are first generation students. Uh, who come from family, I came from a family, it was just expected. I would go to college and there would be support and help and counseling, uh, but uh, more than a third of our students don't have anything like that. And we've gotta be a home to those students to help them move into productive lives and, and jobs and uh, opportunities as opposed to a more common path for those first generation students who don't get into uh, college and end up on paths of welfare or 
or worse uh, in, in our criminal system. So uh, we think this is a huge component of what we're supposed to be doing in this valley. Now that said, with all that openness and inclusiveness and taking students where we are, we are setting standards and expectations uh, in this valley. We are also attracting the best and the brightest in this valley, even as we're remaining open in mission. So our biggest single budget investment has been in full-time faculty. Uh, I love our adjunct faculty. We have a lot of adjunct faculty. They come with a lot of practical experience, uh, which is good. But to really build a serious institution, you have to have those uh, folks trained at the best graduate schools who are in this for the long term. And we now have, I think, an appropriate level of instruction uh, offered that way. Uh, since uh, uh, we became uh, a university and we've been working on this, especially in this administration, really zero in our graduation rates, 100% increase uh, since we started <coughs> in 2008. And then it's just some practical things to help create the right environment, structured enrollment. So yes, we're open admissions. You apply, you get in. But we do have enrollment standards. And if you don't hit those enrollment standards, then you're carefully uh, counseled into the part of the university that works for you. So anybody is basically welcome. And you can come and work on a two-year degree or a certificate program. But if you're really going to move into those four-year university degrees, you have to show that you're college ready, you've got the right ACT score, you've got a, the right uh, GPA, or you've had a, a year's worth of uh, college level work that shows you're proficient. Uh, we've established a new lecture series, new a freshman convocation to create a more intellectual, more rigorous uh, environment uh, so that people know they're really at a true university that way. And we have our first uh, program of national significance, a top 10 program. And that's our personal financial planning program that is now consistently uh, every year, at least in the top 10, if not the top five programs uh, in the nation. Uh, and then engage. The third component is uh, this idea of being applied, practical, doing the things that you're learning in the classroom. Uh, lots of different ways that we're focusing. Here are four key pillars uh, that we talk about. Um, uh, internships, thousands of internships every year. Most of them in our businesses here uh, in the Valley and in our civic institutions. Um, we're just on the front end of undergraduate research. We have We've not done a lot of research at UVU. We need to do more of it, but it needs to be consistent with our teaching mission. And so focusing our faculty on working with undergraduates is the way to do that. We've got about 100 projects going now. Uh, global intercultural, as, uh, as we see from the reports already this morning, uh, we have to look outside of Utah County for our future, and we have to look around the nation and increasingly around the world. And so we've got a new Center for Global and Intercultural Engagement with dozens of different engagement opportunities, formal engagement opportunities for our students to get them connected with things around the world, including study abroad opportunities. And then finally, most significantly, uh, I would point to our just our general community engagement. We have 170 courses at UVU that have that formal distinction as a, as a service learning course. Uh, that affects about 12,000 students every year. Just some informal analysis of the value added to our surrounding economy would be about $6 million. Uh, for, for students and faculty who are working together with your businesses, your communities, your civic uh, entities to do projects that have uh, immediate impact that are tied to the things they're being trained in. So, um, one of the things this does, you've probably heard me say this before, but we talk uh, uh, a lot about this because it's a very unique uh, thing in higher education today. It's something we're getting a lot of attention for now, not just locally, but nationally and internationally. We're effectively a two-for-one institution, especially by virtue of being uh, inclusive on one hand and serious on the other hand. So under the inclusive realm, we still uh, very importantly play a, the role of a community college in this valley open admissions, low tuition, lots of two-year degrees and certificate programs that we still continue to build out. That is now operating side-by-side -side with an excellent first-rate teaching institution with 75 bachelor's degrees, eight master's degrees, properly trained faculty, escalating levels of preparation of our best students in the valley with the programs that they want. And this is happening under the same set of buildings, under the same set of administrators, with the same faculty. It's a remarkable two-for-one investment uh, for the state in terms of higher education today. 
And just to show you uh, how, how unique this is, this is a map that highlights all of the institutions of higher education in the nation that teach, that offer a bachelor's, master's, or associate's degree. And they're color-coded here. So the bachelor's is, is in the orange, the master's is, is yellow, and the associate's is green. And you can see the distribution within an institution about how much they do of, of each uh, element. So there are about 4,600 uh, institutions in the nation that, that teach one or offer one or more of those degrees. So if that's our starting point, then we say, okay, let's look at uh, those that are, are above 10,000, and that dramatically reduces things. So you know already UVU is in a, a fairly select group of very large institutions uh, in the nation. Then you consider those that are public. About another 100 institutions fall off. So we're, uh, this is the category of large public institutions, and we've gone from now 4,000 to 400 already on just that dimension. Now we look at this idea of staying open admissions, and look what happens to the data as that happens. Most everything starts to turn green. And what that tells you is that most of those institutions are basically community colleges or junior colleges that have stayed open admissions. Not many universities have done this. But you see something going on here uh, in, uh, in, in Utah. And you're starting to see a little something going on there in Florida with a couple of other exceptions uh, around the nation. Um, so then you look at those, well, how many of them offer at least 10% associates and 10% uh, bachelors? And then the number really goes down. You've got about a dozen institutions, Utah sort of leading the way, um, uh, Florida. And what's happening there is Florida has just now started to figure out the Utah model and they're allowing some of their two-year institutions to start offering four-year degrees. If you take that up to, say, 25%, uh, then uh, you see that all, all that's really left, with the exception of a school in Texas and one up in Alaska, is, uh, is UVU and Utah State, and just for fun, we'll of over 30,000. <laughs> 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 We're the last ones. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so there's, there's nobody uh, trying to do what we're doing on the scale that we're doing that. So that means we're either really crazy uh, or, or a pioneer of something really important. And I think uh, it's the latter. And, um, and I, I, I want to just step you through some things that would highlight that and then some outside endorsements that would suggest that's true. So um, this number, 34,979, that's our student headcount right now, largest in the state. Uh, that's not just a demographic factor. Yes, we're a fast growing uh, uh, part of the country. But it's a reflection of all those things I've just talked about. Students are coming and they're staying. Our biggest growth rate is actually coming not from new freshmen, it's from juniors and seniors who are not transferring, who historically would have. We have the programs they want, uh, they love the engaged learning model, they love the atmosphere of the campus, and it's drawing students in. And I can promise you this, by the end of the semester, I'm going to find 21 more students. Let's <laughs> make it a clean 35K. Right. Um, so, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the ultimate uh, higher education journal in our, in our nation, is starting to take notice. This is a recent report they did about Utah Valley University now enrolling more, even despite what I've said about our biggest growth rate coming from juniors and seniors, we now enroll more freshmen in Utah than any other four-year institution uh, in the state. Uh, but more importantly to me is not how many more are coming in, but what we're doing on the back end and how things are changing. So since we start, I started in 2009, and we've had this focus on helping students retain and graduate. Uh, you see the change in numbers of awards. So that's certificate associates, bachelor's, or master's. And by the way, these are mostly bachelor's degrees, so this isn't padded with a lot of certificate programs. Uh, and what you see is over that time that we are, uh, the change in the numbers of awards has, has changed more rapidly at UVU than any other institution uh, in, in the state right now. And this is not, by the way, a function uh, also of demographics. If you compare our enrollments to 2910 to 2014-15, they're almost the same. You know we have this little dip 
because of the missionary age change where we had an outflux of students. So uh, we're going to come back up again. So that what that mostly shows is not more students, it's just that we're doing better in getting them finished with degrees moving out the back door. So uh, just a few factoids here now uh, about uh, among all the Utah system of higher education, uh, where we are, second highest number of associate's degrees, third highest number of bachelor's degrees, most bachelor degrees in computer science, a big uh, in-demand uh, market for us right now, second most bachelor's degrees in business in the state. That's again an attentiveness on our end, not only to produce more graduates, but in the fields where they're most needed for economic development today. Um, you can see that our, um, our averages are in almost every category above state averages for employability for our students. Again, I think that has something to do that with that engaged learning preparation. And we have the highest percentage of students who stay in Utah one year after graduation. So we are a Utah-focused uh, institution. We get more students from Utah and stay here on a, a higher percentage than other institutions. So uh, with that, we just completed a university-wide economic impact study um, of our graduating class, a record number of degrees were issued uh, in, uh, uh, in this year, including uh, the graduate at the graduate level 97. The annual impact uh, of our graduating class would be $54 million, and our overall ROI, return on investment for every dollar the state invests in the state of Utah that generates another $8.04 into our economy. Um, again, uh, a part of our, our attention here is really making sure that all these things are connected in the areas that are focused on economic development. So here's a sampling of some of the programs that we've developed. Uh, and you know, you gotta appreciate, I'm an old school humanities, liberal arts and sciences guy. I love that education. I think it has an important role, but we've also got to be really attentive and making sure that we're creating the right kinds of opportunities where the jobs are. And so you see everything from mechatronics and robotics to sales and cybersecurity to also some very pressing social issues in this valley with autism and social work. Uh, so uh, we move forward with that. We're trying to meet industry needs through career pathways. We just had a major uh, conference with uh, the other public education leaders in the in <coughs> Utah Summit and Long Beach counties. These are the specific career pathways that we've worked out with public ed, where you start in public ed at a fairly young age, high school and even sometimes in the junior high, where students can be shown, if you want to work in these areas, and we give them examples of what that means and how much money they can make, we start to show them the path they can take starting in public ed so that they're ready and hire it to finish those uh, degrees and be ready for uh, pra a practical skill set where there are jobs. Uh, we're also uh, grateful to have Daryl Hammond here, and, uh, and Daryl is doing a fantastic job for us. Uh, one of the things we've done, uh, if, you, if you look at his title, Associate Vice President for Academic Outreach and Economic Development, that's not a very common title for university these days, but it's our commitment to say, we want someone who's full-time dedicated to reaching out to industry. What are, you, what are the workforce development needs? Where do we need to be beyond the regular confines of our main campus to take the university to you? And, uh, and that's what Daryl and his team have been working on. We've had a number of sector strategy conversations with leaders from healthcare, government, behavioral social work, the STEM fields, hospitality, early childhood development. Uh, Daryl and his team go meet with those leaders They then come back to campus and meet with uh, our deans and our college heads to figure out how do we reconfigure our curriculum, what new programs do we need to develop, and uh, we're starting to see lots of, uh, lots of success there. There's also just individual meetings. In addition to these sector meetings, individual industries where we go out to determine is there a needed certificate or a degree program that we could work on? And you can see some examples uh, uh, there of the work that uh, Daryl's doing. And just so you can see his handsome picture one more time. Uh, uh, here are uh, uh, committees, if you will, around uh, each of our CTE programs, our career and technical education programs. So these are advisory committees from industry, so again, that our curriculum is being driven as much as possible by uh, folks, folks who do what we teach. And again, 
So often that, for whatever reason, that doesn't happen in higher education, but we really want to make the most robust commitment we can to listening to industry uh, moving forward. Um, and uh, lots of, again, experiential learning. We've talked about all of our internships and things we're doing in the public sector and the, and the private sector to get our students involved. Capstone projects being encouraged all across uh, the disciplines, doing some really significant things in digital media, electronic automation, computer science, software engineering. These seniors are doing some really impressive things that are having that impact uh, in uh, both the social sector and the private sector. And again, uh, starting some very impressive uh, front-end uh, faculty mentored research things in uh, ecology, biopharmaceutical, uh, paleoclimatology, uh, that's uh, I know Bill's favorite area of the study. So. Uh, <laughs> he's gonna explain to you what that means afterwards. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, the greatest marker of our success is our students. That's where I started. It's our student success. It's the core of what we do. And look at what some of our students are doing on an uh, individual basis. This is just a smattering of the things that I could tell you about. But um, trades and technical education still alive and well. Yeah, we're winning third year in a row. We took home the national championship at Skills USA. Uh, five uh, students named uh, Innovation Fellows by the National Science Foundation, that's the ultimate sort of uh, uh, national association for basic science uh, study and teaching. Ameritrade did a national uh, uh, scholarship competition, had 12 slots available, four of them won by UVU students out of our personal financial planning program. 74% uh, pass rate for the certified financial analysis exam. Uh, Wall Street Journal's called this the hardest exam in the world. The average uh, pass rate for first-time undergraduates is 16%. That's our first-time undergraduate pass rate at 74%. That's, that's what can happen when you get teachers focused on not their own publication record, not external projects, but working on this, the success of their students moving forward. Uh, just recently, the student, first student from Utah uh, named the Stanford Innovation Fellow. Uh, digital media students just won uh, their first uh, Emmy. Uh, PR students won the Gold Spike for the Best of Show Award. And uh, financial uh, uh, counseling and planning education, uh, UVU won their Knowledgeable Championship. So uh, it's great stuff, and the world is starting to take note. This was a recent article done in the Chronicle of Higher Education about this model that we have of bringing the community college and the university together and focusing on student success, uh, being proud of us, as it says, of our workforce ethos and helping people move forward to completion in areas where they need. Uh, education Dive, that's an education daily, web-based daily, uh, that recently did an article on us calling UVU uh, and schools like us the future of higher education, where one system can address the full needs of the state's workforce with multiple resources for education. And even internationally, this is the Times Higher Education, this is the UK's um, leading publication for higher education, and uh, has taken note of this dual mission and the impact it's having. So uh, we're, 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 we're very grateful for the community that we live in. And we're working very hard to try to give back and, and produce the kinds of students that you need, train in the areas that you need. We're not perfect, we've got a lot to do, that's why we're here today, we want to keep meeting with you, getting your input, but uh, with that, uh, I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting to see, uh, young, young, I'm going on 76, when I was younger, when Geneva. That's months, 76 months? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Um, and going out of this, I thought, how on earth are they ever going to clean that up? And now it looks like it. And so obviously, you've got an opportunity to move west. Yeah. And you are moving west. Uh, how, what are some of the things as you move west, you know, in your campus yeah. that, are, that you have planned for entrepreneurs, um, you know, uh, where they can come to, to a certain area and get the help that they're looking for? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I've actually got, I can not only respond, I've got something I can show you about that. So, but can I hold on that? Just let me see if there's some other questions, then I'll, I'll show you a couple of slides as I wrap up on that very issue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what else? Anything else on your mind? 
Yeah. What bachelor degrees aren't, aren't you offering that you are aiming towards making a part of your office? Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, <clears throat> Daryl, do you? I mean, it's probably been discussed in academic affairs. We've, we've made so much progress. I mean, if you'd asked me this three years ago, I'd have given you 20 off the spot. We've we've put them into place. So, uh, Can I follow up? Yeah. Like, I'm interested in how, what's the process for getting bachelor's degrees in engineering and okay. those kinds of things? Yeah, so that, that's probably the most obvious one uh, is, is engineering that people ask a, a lot about. Uh, we know there's great demand for engineers uh, in the state. Uh, frankly, it gets to be a bit of a political problem. Uh, so uh, the U and Utah State have are the two engineering schools in the state. They kind of guard that role jealously uh, a little bit. Uh, so we have added software engineering and we've added computer engineering. It's taken a fair amount of effort. We had to kind of marshal the community support. Uh, I think there's still room for more engineering uh, at UVU. And so we're working on that. We're in the process of hiring a new dean for that campus, and one of the criteria said we need you to help get us ready for uh, for future engineering. I think uh, probably electrical and mechanical make the most sense. I don't think we're frankly ready for a full-scale engineering college, uh, but I do think we probably ought to be thinking about electrical engineering for sure if it's close enough with the computer uh, science programs that we're doing and the computer and uh, computer engineering that we've already started. So uh, that's a, that's probably the the, the, role the top of the list for me. More power to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. With the large projected increase of student population, what's the plan for housing on campus, off campus, that type of thing? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that one too. I've got a, a couple of slides to show you. That's the final deal with both these questions. Yeah. With the basketball team having such good success, do you plan on coming out of retirement? Yeah. I do, I do have four years of eligibility. <laughs> so when we get into the tournament and they really need me, I am prepared to suit up. <laughs> Said by my old friend Brian Anderson, who could kill me one on one any day. <laughs> and a former player at Utah Valley University. So. Yes. Uh, along that vein, I was just at a conference uh, last weekend uh, for professional education and uh, had the opportunity to talk to the director of professional ed from Boise State. Uh, they just conducted a very in depth study on the impact on academic success of the successful COPO program that they had. They saw that out of state income for tuition increased, and, and so money to the university and graduation rates spiked and have continued at that level since they won a division, uh, the first division championship in football. So, towards that end, since we've already begun this successful yeah. uh, stomping on other institutions in the valley, <laughs> is there an appetite for additional sports? Uh, yeah. That's uh, the future day. Uh, go ahead and have your cougars on. Yeah. So, um, a couple things on that. You know, it's, it's a question that gets asked a lot about. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan. I think it would be great uh, for us to have a football team in some ways. Um, the, uh, the, there are two things. One is uh, we think we can get a lot of that same impact uh, you know, with, uh, with a basketball team. But I predict uh, very shortly, uh, maybe this season, if not uh, shortly thereafter, we'll be a regular presence in the NCAA tournament. Uh, there's a lot of money in basketball much more so than there was even five or six years. Now part of that's because there's so much money in football, but the way it gets distributed, uh, uh, you can start to get a lot of money and a lot of attention in that way in basketball. We also uh, have a very this very successful soccer team, top uh, 20 team in the nation all year long. Uh, we have the 16th highest attendance rate for soccer. If you haven't, you should. I think this is going to be a, a kind of a, a mecca, if you will, a, a tourism and travel mecca as we move forward in the state. This is a, a picture of a few panes of glass, it's stained glass, uh, by, by Tom Holden, a local artist who's got his uh, shop in Lehigh. And um, it's, uh, uh, it's a massive stained glass treatment of the history of knowledge, of art, architecture, philosophy, medicine, law science, technology, uh, it kind of starts with the dawn of civilization, goes up to contemporary times. Uh, just a few more pictures. Uh, it's 10 feet high, it's 200 feet wide, it sits in the front of our library. Uh, it's 60,000 different pieces of glass, and uh, it's just absolutely stunning. If you haven't seen it, you should go over today. 
and check it out. It's you can anytime the library is open, you can just walk in and see it. Um, the uh, it's gotten lots of attention. All the major newspapers in the state have covered it multiple times uh, with various articles. Um, it's been covered locally on the news. It's been covered by the Fox affiliate in New York. We had some of the windows on display in New York for a while, then a few of the windows on display in London and in Oxford. A uh, reporter from The Guardian, one of the main newspapers in the UK, came to see it and did a major story on it, and her assessment was these are some of the most spectacular stained glass windows built in the last century. So uh, we think this is, uh, if nothing else, a little fun fact you can point to about uh, the exciting things that are going on in this valley. I think it's going to be a real draw and something uh, we want to make as an asset to the whole state. And uh, we're going to be building out an app where you can kind of drag your phone across the image and see uh, what's behind it, start to learn about the history. We've partnered with the Utah Educational Network. We think it's a great pedagogical tool. Uh, it's one of these things that draw, it, it has this, it seems to have the same drawing power for the four or five year old who's just mesmerized by the, by the art of it as it does the PhD trained faculty who are building capstone courses around these windows. So uh, just something to be aware of. Um, uh, another big project moving forward, uh, right across the street, the next big project for us at UVU uh, is uh, a new building for the largest business school in the state. Uh, so that, this is effectively where the Woodbury School of Business is now. We build out here towards the University Parkway, but also a new front entrance to the largest university in the state. Uh, we're running out of administrative space, and so we'll be taking this to the legislature uh, this year. We're, we're actually getting the last tranche of our funding for the arts building, so I'm not overly optimistic we'll get this this year, but we're certainly going to start pitching it. We'd invite your support for that. Uh, we need to do some fundraising uh, for it, so uh, uh, I, Russ, for, if you've got your checkbook, we can, we can just take that. <laughs> <laughs> the last check. Yeah. Your legacy, right here. <laughs> Now, back to a couple of the other, other questions as I thought you might ask. Um, you know, what's the, what's the future of UVU? So, uh, we have taken uh, a bunch of that land that used to be Geneva Steel. I think it's a great uh, symbolic uh, statement, if nothing else, and that Geneva Steel was an anchor for so many years in this valley of um, industry and opportunity. Well, we want to recreate that, but for the new economy and for the new world that we live in. And so, uh, we're taking this out, and this is this is going to happen over lots and lots of years. But uh, in this uh, kind of northwest corner would be the campus, if you will, with interconnected buildings like we have uh, at uh, at UVU today. This is the front runner stop, and that's one front runner stop from where we are right here. This southern area then becomes a really dynamic sports complex. We've already got those intramural playing fields out there. We put out some regular turf fields, uh, track and field there, tennis courts. Uh, eventually, our, our basketball arena, we move out there, a student uh, athlete complex for trainers and conditioning and coaches' offices. And then uh, a sports stadium here. Uh, initially, this will be a soccer stadium. Then when I leave and Wynn takes over, it can become a football stadium. Uh, <laughs> and, then, um, and then here, this starts our, what we're, we're calling our, our and, by the way, and eventually would even move the, the baseball uh, fields uh, out here. This would then create, um, this corner, our kind of community engagement corner. And we'll probably start on this as soon as anything. So this would be, um, ultimately, we think we'd like, we're having so much success here in, in the Business Resource Center that we're kind of growing out of uh, our space here. We need something bigger uh, uh, and, and redesigned in some ways, and so that could be the home of this. And by the way, there's all sorts of commercial stuff going on in and around us here. And then that would be a business innovation center, a uh, place to do a lot of entrepreneurial stuff. This would be a conference center. Those could all work together in a very dynamic uh, kind of space. Um, now, by virtue of doing that, by the way, uh, what this does, and we didn't, frankly, this wasn't the way we originally thought this would go, but as we got really thinking about it and doing the analysis, by virtue of moving some of these things, the athletics in particular, out here, we can, uh, uh, we've already talked through all those things, we can reconceptualize what we do with the main campus. 
And by virtue of kind of taking out a lot of that athletic stuff, we create a beautiful new promenade and culminating with our library here and the Roots of Knowledge windows, which are right there, with a new set of buildings that flank each side. That's the new classroom building that's already in. And that would become effectively the new front face of campus. And then, again, this has been over a lot of years, we'd have another promenade going this way uh, with building buildings around that kind of southern perimeter with some, you know, the, probably one of the most valuable pieces of real estate in the state, uh, uh, the second busiest intersection of the state, and build all that out. And then also build out uh, our west campus. And uh, so to the, the question about kind of the kinds of things we might do, we really see this as probably anchoring a health sciences campus where we're doing a lot with, uh, with uh, the health industries that are developing. There's a great demand for us. We're on the cusp of uh, looking to develop uh, respiratory therapy. Might be a new addition for us coming soon. I think you're going to see a cascade of those programs coming forward. By the way, that leads to one other thing, which I will, so we've talked about that promenade there. We'll need some infrastructure to make this happen, a new 8th South uh, interchange. Uh, and most importantly this year, a new pedestrian overpass. So that's something we'll be taking to the legislature, really invite your support and endorsement of that. That not only connects our west campus with our east campus, but helps drive a lot of this traffic on the uh, mass transit where uh, the intermodal hub station can take in people here and send them right across the freeway to, to school over there. And then eventually a new off-ramp northbound I-15 that would tunnel right into campus. We think if we do those three things, we can actually fit another 10, 15,000 students onto this campus that two years ago we thought was landlocked, and now we've got a whole new vision for how that can work. So you're the only uh, university that has I-15 running right through the middle. Yeah, that's right. So we'll get a little, uh, maybe a toll booth, and then yeah. we can find our <laughs> <laughs> How about a university hospital? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no, was, uh, there was a question about uh, student housing. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll right. close on that now. So uh, already, by virtue of doing this master plan, um, the, the, the private sector is responding. Now, what, we, we look very seriously about thinking about getting into student housing. The students would love it if we had on-campus housing. Uh, but once again, it, it comes with uh, some real costs. Because you don't just build buildings, you've got to hire more police, you've got to have more staff. Uh, uh, and this is very expensive real estate right now. And we, we, we're a growing university, so we, our sense is we think that we've got enough uh, property around us and, this, and the private sector is responding enough, we're just letting them take care of that. That's already happened here. Private developer went in and basically bought up about 25 homes and they're going to turn that into about 1,200 beds immediately adjacent to campus. We're working with them in a kind of public-private partnership. They initiated it, and they came around and, and made a nice pitch to us about how we could get involved with that. There's currently a uh, discussion about a development here. Uh, this is getting to be, this one's a little more controversial. The neighbors aren't quite as, they were okay with this one. They're not as good about that one, but we're letting our public processes play out. The mayor's uh, been a uh, a great uh, facilitator of that dialogue uh, to see if we can work and let those things work out. But we're kind of sitting on the sidelines for that one. But what we are saying is in the future, is we think that that student housing already there could be rebuilt and go up. Uh, we want to try to take that corner if we can. We've already talked to the LDS Church about uh, if, if they'd be amenable to letting us buy that stake center, a piece of property there. And then a lot of development over here. There's that full piece of property there. Been talking with the owners about that. They would like to do uh, something collaboratively, and you can put a lot of student housing, high density housing there. This is already being built out. You see as we speak, um, uh, there's a developer's got a piece of property there and there. So we see student housing uh, developing on the southwest edge of campus in a high density way that, if connected with Front runner bus, bus rapid transit, pedestrian overpass creates this very dynamic higher education space of students, buildings, and academic student life together. So I've overstayed my welcome. Thank you all.
Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, an opportunity for us to, to see uh, the combination of skills that make this kind of growth possible. Uh, you know, true leaders are people that have the ability to, to develop a, a compelling vision, to have the leadership to bring collaborative alignment around that vision, and then to have the political and social relational skills to bring the resources uh, together to make that a reality. And clearly, uh, where UVU is now, not just as a, a second top but now an aspirational institution, is uh, truly a result of, of, of Matthew Holland's efforts. Um, since the operation that I received, I seem only able to, to say praises, say praises of Matthew, but, but evidently that it works. A lot of the work was done at the professional level across a lot of spectrum of people, and, uh, and was done evidently by the by the editorial staff of Education Die, which is uh, at a higher education chronicle that uh, just awarded Matthew Holland uh, Executive of the Year uh, this this year in higher education. The other institutional executives that were up for that award included uh, institutions uh, out of California like Stanford University, which is an aspiring uh, community college trying to become a university, <laughs> much like uh, the path of UVU. But, uh, Matthew, well done. Thank you. We're, we're honored to have you as our president. Thank you.